In the previous video, we learned the basic about selectors. We discussed the structure of selectors and how we can easily manipulate them. We started with a very simple hierarchy of selectors using Notepad. Let's start with a much more complicated setup and we'll check the structure of the selectors. Let's launch the UI Explorer. We will use UiPath.com website for example. Now let's select a link in this page. Let's say this link. Now as you can see, the hierarchy is getting more interesting. So instead of using application controls, this one uses the HTML tags to identify the target object. As you can see, the hierarchy is much deeper. So as we go to each one of the parents from bottom to top, the objects moves from the inner HTML tag to the parent HTML until it reaches the uppermost object, which is the browser. Again, if we select one of these tags, they can include one or multiple children too. Using this tool, you can easily switch from one object to another without going through the recording all over again. As you noticed, the structure is long but UiPath only used two lines of selectors. So it only captures the topmost and the bottom part. That's because this is the only data UiPath needs to be able to identify this link. By default, the UiPath algorithm tries to use minimal and stable selectors which will work best for the target object. Now if you need to add a selector, it can easily be done by just putting a check in the selected tag and it will be added as a new entry automatically. You can add as many parent tags as you need to improve your selector. Now let's take a look to each individual tag and how the selector is being structured. As you know, each line represents an object on the screen. It follows a single tag code structure, which enclosed in angle brackets. The slanting line at the end of the code signals the end of the tag. The tags are used to identify screen objects. In our example, we have HTML and web control as screen objects. The pattern is completed through attributes and values which are unique for each object. In the case of our previous notepad example, the main objects of our tags are WND, which stands for window, and CTRL, which stands for Windows Control. Depending on the target object, each XML tag can have one or more attributes like the title, ID, name, or tag. This makes it a lot easier to uniquely identify the correct target object. The next one, coded after the equal sign, is the value. The value of the attributes helps uniquely identify the UI object. The first line of our XML code defines the HTML document, which has a title, UiPath Robotic Automation. The searching of the UI object goes from top to bottom. It will continue to execute to the next line as long as the execution is successful. Attributes can easily be modified, no need to type it in manually. You can click one of the tags and it will pull up the available attributes on the right side. You can then easily add remove attributes by checking or unchecking the items. In the case of our top level tag, the UiPath browser window, it is important to keep the attributes unique and constant. So if I remove the title attribute from this HTML document, it will run the automation to any opened websites. The problem is when it runs in a wrong document, it won't be able to identify the target object and it won't be able to perform the automation successfully. So in summary, what composes the selector makes it easier for the robot to identify the correct target object. And it runs from top to the bottom part of the structure. Let's have another example, let's say a Java application. Let's target this About button. Here our tags consist of WND or Window and Java for Java application. The structure of our selectors looks similar to our previous examples, they only differ in attributes. So if we interpret each line, the page tab list is the tabs showing up on top.
it targets the general tab. And lastly, the push button, which has a name about. So what are the methods of automation that doesn't use selectors? In some cases, using selectors is impossible to use. And the most obvious example is in Citrix automation. Only the top level window of Citrix or remote desktop window can be identified by a selector. So the best way to handle this is by using OCR or optical character recognition to identify elements inside the top level window. Another method is by using keyboard commands or hotkeys. Though this is limited, it can be very helpful and can produce a faster automation, especially if you're handling document forms with lots of input and text fields. There are two types of selectors. The first one is a full selector and the second one is partial. They can be generated using one of these two recording options. We'll start with the full selectors. When we click on basic, and record using automatic recorder, a full selector is automatically generated, meaning one activity contains all the data in it to run the automation. Let's run it for example in the sample font dialog in the notepad. So if we click on record and select basic, let's use the automatic recorder. And now let's click on bold as an example in the font style. Okay, that's it for now. Let's press escape and save the recording. Now as you can see, we have a single item in a recording sequence, the select item activity. Let's pull up the selectors generated for this activity. Take note that we have four lines of selectors. This completes the data it needs to find a specific object on the screen. Let's compare it with the partial selector. Let's run the recording again, but this time we'll select desktop recording. This is the option you use if you want to generate partial selectors. Let's record the exact UI object. Let's run the automatic recorder and select bold in the font style. Okay, let's save the recording and let's check the workflow. This time, it's a little bit different. We now have two tiers of activities before it reaches the select item activity. The first one is attach window activity. This contains a selector to capture the top level document, the font style dialog box, and all activities running after the do activity will take action within the top level window. Let's check the selectors of the select item activity. Okay. Right now, you can only see three lines of selectors instead of four in the previous one. What is happening here is the attach activity has the top level selector, which is the font window of the notepad. So meaning you can have multiple activities inside this container without repeating the top level selector. This is very useful when you are running lots of other automation inside a specific screen region. It saves up time and it makes the automation process a lot more faster. So, which one should you use? In general, you should start with partial selectors because it eliminates redundancy. This works good if you are running in the same application window and doing a lot of automation in it. However, there are cases that you have to use full selectors. One best example is when you are switching a lot between low-level application windows. Your workflow will have redundant attached window activity if you use partial selectors. So it's best to use full selectors because it makes your workflow clean and easy to understand. In some cases, the attribute values of an application could change. The best example are dynamic web pages, secured sites, and web login forms. Let's talk how we can handle that in the next video.